four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a student talking to the study abroad coordinator at her university. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, Leela. Please sit down. So you were interested in studying abroad next year, right? Yes, that's right. I've always wanted to live and study in South America. OK, well, I have to go over a few things with you first, Leela. Once I get some information, I can tell you about studying abroad. What is your last name? Kim. That's K-I-M-H. OK, now, when are you interested in studying abroad? I want to study my entire third year of university abroad. Wow, that's a long while, but well worth it. Have you ever lived or studied abroad before? Yes, I took a summer language program in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Will you be applying for financial aid for your year abroad? I think I will be. Living costs are lower in South America, but plane tickets can be very expensive. What kind of degree do you want? I plan to obtain a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and Latin American History. I'm especially interested in how countries there became democracies. That sounds very interesting. Do you have any idea what countries you want to study in? I think I'll do one semester in Bolivia and then another semester in Peru. That's all the basic information I need. Just ask if you need anything else. Before you hear the rest of the dialogue, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now, Leela, there are some things I have to explain to you about going abroad for a year. You know that it can be difficult at times. Yes, actually, I had a friend who went to China for just a semester. She said the language barrier was quite a problem. Actually, not only is there a language barrier, there are also cultural differences that can make living or studying in another country very difficult. You mentioned going abroad before. But over the course of a year, some people can experience severe loneliness. I think I'm prepared to deal with that. Also, you have to be organized when it comes to applying for your study abroad program. Our university here may not accept every course you take abroad. You have to make sure with your academic advisor about which ones are appropriate and will count towards your degree. Understood. Thanks for the advice. Actually, I did want to go over the application procedure briefly with you. I read it on the website, but... Yes, it can be slightly confusing. First of all, please remember to keep your grade point average at 3.2 or above. There are high standards for those sponsored by the school to study in another country. Once you have declared your major, you can begin your research into which programs you want to go to. After filling out the appropriate application, you will submit them to the Office of Study Abroad. After they review your materials, you will be informed about whether or not you can study abroad under the university's name. You will also be informed about how much financial aid you will receive. Sounds slightly daunting. Well, from what I have seen, I don't think you need to worry. OK, then. I'll print the forms from the online website now and get started. Good luck, Leela. Thank you so much. No problem. If you have any other questions, please email or call. I will. Bye, then. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear an orientation given to new students about technology services on campus. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the orientation and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone has enjoyed orientation week so far. I know that you all have been getting quite a bit of information, but I really do need to give you some more regarding the Information and Computer Services, ICS, here at Kudrow College. I've been here long enough to remember when kids hauled their typewriters around. Having a computer, whether it is a desktop or laptop, is now indispensable. They are so necessary, in fact, that our school is willing to help students with financial aid, if they need it, in order to purchase a computer. If you want to know how the school can help you get a computer, please visit our website or the IECS Centre. Though we coordinate the One Student, One Computer programme, our main task at ICS is to help students deal with any technical issues that they have. We have a help desk where students can call in and ask about any computer problems they have. At this time of the school year, the help desk assists students with connecting computers to the school network. Included in your orientation packets are instructions on how to do so. As you can see, the instructions for connecting a Windows-based PC is much more complicated than for an Apple computer. We actually recommend the latter because it is good for students to focus on their work, not on solving problems that come from the computer's operating system. If you call the help desk, you can also get help with things like connecting your printer. Best of all, if your computer is having major problems, you can bring it in and get it serviced. Before you hear the rest of the orientation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I will tell you how to bring in your computer if you have any problems with it. If I'm not there, you can talk to the full-time attendant, Jacob, that's J-A-K-O-B, Bianchi. Jacob has many years of experience in computer service. Please feel free to ask him anything. He is there Monday through Friday and can figure out what you need help with. We are located in Taylor Building. Our extension is 7760. This year, we also have extended opening hours. We are open both weekdays and weekends. During the week, we are open from 9 to 7, and on Saturdays, from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. Fill out a form, and if you need to, drop your computer off. We'll get it fixed right away. Thank you all for listening, and good luck with your studies. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Kayana, and a professor about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Dr. Reed. Are you busy right now? Do you mind if I come in for a second? Hey, Kiana. No, I don't mind at all. Thanks. I just wanted to say that I'm enjoying your urban studies course and that I'm having some trouble with the first assignment. OK, no problem. What do you want to ask? This is my first time writing a paper of this length. All right. What sort of trouble are you running into? Well, writing more than 10 pages is actually turning out to be quite a task. 
I've been rereading some of the material, and I'm just not sure how to approach the assignment. Yes, it takes some time to get used to academic writing assignments. More time than I expected, really. I also want to do a really good job on the assignment. I don't want to put a half-hearted effort into it. I'm glad to hear that. I'll say that these assignments get easier to manage as time goes on. That's a small relief. I mean, it gets easier to plan the assignment and to organize one's time, but it still takes hard work and a sincere effort to produce a good piece of academic writing. My role is to guide you to the readings I think are the most relevant and to give you tips on managing your time. Okay, could we talk about the readings then? Sure, we can go over them. I guess I want to ask about the Cole House text first. It seems like a pretty interesting book. But sometimes a bit over the top, no? I would recommend reading just the first part of the book. It's the most relevant to the assignment that I gave you. The rest of the text goes on about a topic we will cover later in the semester. All right, I'll just read the intro then. As for the Peely article, oh, did you read that one? Yes, I accessed it online and then printed it out. Okay, I would recommend you review that again. Also, remember what I said about the Liebskid article? I think you told the class to focus on the research methods, right? Yes, she approaches the problem in an innovative way. Let's see. For the Gary article, I think you should... Let me see. I think it would be best for you to read just the conclusion. Just the conclusion? I see. Yes, I would ask you to read the whole thing, but this way would be more efficient. Speaking of which, you should not bother reading the Wolfson article. Yeah, it didn't seem particularly relevant to the topic. Let's see. Any other reading you wanted to talk about? Let me see. Um, yes, the Cuddler article. What do you think of that one? Ah, yes. How could I forget? That one is pretty central to the topic. I really think you must go over it again. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to ask about? Yes, I wanted to ask about the line graph that you provided. It seems that the legend identifying the different parts is not there. Ah, it must not have been photocopied correctly. Here, let me explain them. They all represent percentages of the population in Manassas, OK? Line 1 here at the top is the percentage of people who were born in a foreign country. Born outside the country. OK, and this one? The next line down, line 2 refers to the percentage of people with citizenship. All right, got it. Those making a middle-class wage are represented by the fifth line down. OK, middle-class wage earners. And the line number 4? That is the percentage of people with a college education or higher. All right, and the one in the middle? That one is the percentage of population who are married and have children. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. I really appreciate your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear the first part of one lecture in a series of lectures about environmental issues. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture series, we have been looking at the most pressing environmental issues that the world faces. One of those issues, global warming, has become very fashionable to talk about in the past decade. Though I'm not trying to diminish its importance as a problem, it must be understood that the effects of an increasingly warm planet will not be seen for many more decades. One problem affecting the lives of people right now is the scarcity of water. The need for fresh water will only increase as the world's population grows, especially in developing countries. In the future, changing weather patterns that come with global warming will only make the problem worse. People need water to drink, cook food, shower and wash clothes. Most of the planet is covered with water, but unfortunately only a tiny percentage of it is fit for human use. Of all the water in the world, less than 3% is fresh water. More than two-thirds of that remaining percentage is locked up in glaciers in Greenland, Antarctica and elsewhere, also unavailable for human use. The water vital for life comes from lakes, rivers, underground aquifers, rain and snow. This surface water, groundwater and precipitation, is not disturbed equally across the Earth's surface. For example, Canada, which has about one-half of one percent of the world's people, contains about ten percent of the world's readily available fresh water. Brazil makes up about three percent of the world's population, but within its borders contain nearly twelve percent of the world's freshwater resources. As the economies of developing countries grow, the need for fresh water also grows. One example of this has to do with the production of meat. In some countries, the demand for beef increases when people earn more money. However, raising cattle is incredibly water-intensive, requiring about 15 tonnes of water for one kilogram of grain-fed beef. The scarcity of water has a direct impact on human life. When people are forced to walk many kilometres to the nearest source of fresh water, it may take hours away from their day. This, in turn, takes time away from school or from other productive work that helps the general economy. A number of solutions have been proposed to deal with the scarcity of water. Some of them are technological, like the construction of desalination plants. These plants convert brackish salty seawater into water fit for human use. They are very expensive to operate and maintain, though, and cannot meet the world's growing demand for water. Other kinds of solutions involve only a little technology or involve modifying individual people's habits. In a rural part of India, a village facing water shortage started collecting rainwater. A simple system allowed them to save water that fell over a large area and use it during dry periods. In the suburbs that surround the cities of developed countries, house owners are using xeriscaping techniques. The main purpose of xeriscaping, unlike traditional landscaping, is to not use supplemental irrigation. This requires the use of plants, shrubs and trees that are appropriate for the climate. In dry areas, this means planting ones that use less water. In the future, many countries will need to use a variety of these techniques in order to provide enough water for their citizens. Water security will be of utmost importance to those governments, especially in areas that are politically unstable. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. <laughs>